Welcome to Heaven's Point of View. My name is J.D. Quinn. We have a series called Love, Marriage, Sex, and Divorce According to the New Testament. I'm happy to be able to co-host with Dr. Tom Shepard, Ph.D., Professor of the New Testament Interpretation at the Andrews University Seminary. Uh, we were talking about uh, degrees a while ago. Tom was a very educated man, and I just absolutely loved what he said. Let's don't concentrate on degrees. Let's concentrate on the Word of God. And so that's what we're paying attention to today is what does the New Testament say about instructions to husbands? But before we go there, Tom, what I'd like to do is to kind of review back mm -hmm. talking about instructions to the wives. Yeah, we're then we'll move forward. Yeah, we were we were talking from uh, Ephesians chapter five is what we were looking at, and the Apostle Paul in uh, this section of Ephesians, he has a series of uh, instructions for the Christian household. There are three groups of people that he talks to in the household. He first talks to wives and then to husbands, okay. then to children and to parents, then to slaves and to masters. These were common groups in the Greco-Roman world that Paul lived in that would be in, a, in any you know, household of any person. You know, they might not all have slaves, but slaves were fairly common in the ancient world. It wasn't the same kind of slavery as in uh, yeah. that, uh, you know. They were just more members of the family well, they that were may not have been related. Yeah, and, and I mean, slavery is never good. It never yes. has been good. Yeah. Uh, but it was probably worse here in the United States than it was back in the ancient world. Okay. People could buy their way out of slavery and some other things. But uh, we're focusing on this uh, instruction to the household. Now, the book of Ephesians, as we've said before, breaks into two sections. The first three chapters are about theology. The last three chapters about how you apply that, how you show it in your life. And we come to chapter 5. Uh, we've already been looking at Ephesians 5 in some detail. We said that the, um, the only way for uh, the family to really have success is to be submitted to the Holy Spirit. And we saw that in verses 15 through, uh, 15 through 21. When we came to the instruction to the wives, very interestingly we found in verse 22 of Ephesians 5, that uh, in most translations it'll say, wives submit to your husbands. Interestingly enough, the word submit isn't even in there in Greek. Hmm. Um, it's borrowed from the previous verse, uh, which is good Greek, but not good okay. English. <laughs> so okay. You, you kind of have to show it. But the trouble is that too many times, um, this part that comes just before um, Ephesians 5, 22 and onwards is broken off as a separate section, when actually Ephesians 5, 22 and onwards is a continuation. So Paul says, you've got to be filled with the Holy Spirit and then this has an effect in your life. And the effect that it has on your life, the, the thesis statement that he makes in verse 21 is submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Amen. Amen. And so we come to the wives and he tells them to submit to their husbands as to the Lord. And he describes this idea of the husband as the head of the wife. We said that that illustrated the, that there are three different ways the word head would be used. And Paul uses all three, but probably here he's speaking of the husband as a representative of the family, like you would say the head of the household, but okay. he's representing the family. And uh, then he, he, he makes this comparison and he talks about Christ as the savior of the church, the savior of the body. Um, and he says, but as the church submits to Christ, so wives are also to submit to their husbands and everything. He makes a distinction between Jesus and the husband. The husband is not Jesus. Amen. And uh, the husband is not the savior mm -hmm. of the wife. Mm -hmm. And the wife is not the body of the husband. So um, the husband has a role of leadership, but it's not the same as the leadership role that Christ has. And the husband, uh, when we actually come, now, he's been talking to wives. Uh, too many times there are men who want to focus on what uh, Paul says to the wives, when really what they should focus on is what Paul says, what to, the says to the husbands. Because when they start saying, you need to submit to me. Well, yes. now that's the wrong kind of attitude. Mm, mm. That's uh, the wrong look. You see, uh, the apostle, the same apostle says over in Galatians, there's neither male nor female, slave or free. We're all one in Christ. We're all equal. So equality is an important concept. And we also indicated in a previous program that submission does not mean inferiority. Okay. 
uh, Jesus submitted to his parents and he was certainly not inferior to them. Mm -hmm. Submission does not mean that the person has no relationship to God, that they only go through their husband for something like that. Uh, Paul addresses the wives themselves and he says, you submit to your husband as to the Lord. So they have a personal relationship with Christ themselves. Third, submission does not mean you're a doormat. There's some things that you don't submit to. There's some things that go too far and that are wrong and that should never happen in a home. And so Paul reorganizes the concept of the Christian home with Christ at its center. What would be a synonym for submit? Um, what in the Greek? I mean, what how Well, the, the term actually is two terms put together. It's ipotasso. Ipo is under and tasso is actually to line up. Um, and so you would say to submit, to um, be under or to accept the uh, uh, role of leadership, maybe something like that. Okay. Um, so it has nothing to do with submission. It has to do with just the place in the family. There is the leader, there's the head. Mm-hmm. So since there should just be one head, yeah. well then of course then underneath that is the wife taking her rightful place mm-hmm. with her her role, her executive duties. Yeah. 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 Okay. And so, you know, he, he emphasizes equality between the two people, but he talks about submission. Now, now really when we think about it in life, all of us submit to somebody. Yes. You know, we all have employers, we all have uh, people that are above us uh, in different organizations. And so uh, submission is something that every Christian does. Yeah. And the kind of role of leadership that Jesus is going to talk about, that Paul's going to talk about here, really ties in with what Jesus said. So we'll, we'll see that. So now we should turn over to right. what he says to the husbands. And I like to read verses 25 through 33. This is really the whole section to the husbands. We'll take a few, a couple of sessions for us to go through all of this, but let's read the whole section so we get the context. Okay. Starting with verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. And for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Okay. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Um, now, we notice that uh, this section, where, when Paul writes to the husband, is much longer, much longer than the section that he wrote to the wives. Of the, of the pairs of people that he had, you know, we said that he speaks first to the wives and then to the husbands, speaks to the children, then to the parents, speaks to the slaves and then to the masters. The two groups that have the most said to them are the husbands and the slaves. Mm. Interesting. Mm. Um, probably because they had the most changing to do mm-hmm. in terms of what it meant to be a mm. Christian Amen. in that in that in that Greco-Roman world. They had to go through more modifications, you might say. Yeah. You see, it's kind of interesting that he addresses the wives first. Because in the Greco-Roman world, the the husband, he was called the pater familias, he was large and in charge. He was pretty much the the, the guy with all the power the in the family. You know, he he, what he said was pretty much law. So typically you would think if you're going to address the family, you would start with talking to him. Mm-hmm. That's not what Paul does. Mm. He s- instead starts you're by right. talking to the wives. Right. So he gives you a little indication maybe there from the beginning saying to you, uh, you know, I'm throwing you a curveball here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you need to understand that, that the Christian home isn't like what, uh, what other homes are like. It's a bit right. different than, than those other. I'm not going to talk to the, the top dog first. Yeah. I'm going to talk to somebody lower down uh-huh. first. So he I talks to them. 
But then he does come to the husbands and he just and he describes what he wants them to do. And the big surprise mm-hmm. is he said to the wives, submit to your husbands. What would be the natural word to go with submit? Well, you'd think it might be something like rule yeah. or be in charge, right? Yeah. Or be over them. Or get right? Yeah, you know, get behind me. Or, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Wow. But instead, he says, husbands, love your wives. Amen. And just in case you didn't wow. understand what I meant by that, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for, for her. her. Okay. Now, we've been talking about love, you and me. We've been looking at, uh, we had a look a while back when we looked at uh, 1 Corinthians 13. Mm-hmm. And that verb that we used there was the verb agapao. Its noun is agape. agape. Okay. And that's the term that Paul used in 1 Corinthians 13. Do you remember some of the kinds of terminology that we used in terms of defining what, what love is like? Love is like this and like this and this. Do you remember any of those terminologies? Uh, I know that it's patient. Kind, kind, loving, loving, yeah, showing doesn't, mercy. Doesn't brag. Doesn't yeah. doesn't break out in anger. Yeah. Doesn't yeah. keep track of wrongs. Yeah, no shameful deeds. That's right. And believes all, trusts yeah. all. And, yeah. and, you know, so it's. And then I remember the green stamps. No, the green stamps. Yeah, yeah we talked about green stamps. Yeah. That you don't you don't put those green stamps yeah. in there and store them up. So this is the kind of love that Paul wants husbands to have. Love your wives. So all the things we said there in 1 Corinthians 13 about love and the kinds of things that we said when we studied uh, chesed back in, uh, you, it wasn't mm-hmm. with you, I think it was with your dear wife, uh, when we studied the Old Testament word for loving kindness mm-hmm. and how you help somebody who needs your help but can't insist on it, mm-hmm. that's loving kindness. All that kind of idea, the patient actions, the kind deeds, the showing of mercy, the keeping of confidentiality, the never giving up on the other person, the not bragging, the not bursting out in anger, no shameful deeds, no seeking your own advantage, no keeping track of all that stuff. That's what Paul wants husbands to do. Amen. Now you think about that, my, that is a very different way of thinking about the home. Yeah. And it, it sounds, I mean, these are terms that we deal with all the time, so it doesn't seem that foreign to us. Yes. But I imagine back then, this was foreign thinking. Yeah, I think you're right. So this is kind of a... a paradigm shift. Paradigm shift, exactly. Yeah, yeah that they... Yeah. See, we, we seem to real, little realize, I think, the great impact that Christianity has had on our culture. Now, our culture today yeah. has is going the other direction, I'm afraid. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, you know, it's becoming more pagan. It's yeah. going more in a direction away from that. But, but there are so many uh, influences of Christianity that are seen in the structures yeah. of our society, in our laws, in the patterns of, of how we just think that's the way you ought to act. That is what Paul plants the seeds for here. And he says, yeah. that's the way the Christian home is supposed to be. And the irony of it is that if things don't turn around, well, then someday, if this world were to continue as it is now, which we believe that Christ will come before then, mm. is that uh, this may become foreign again. Yes. This language could yeah. become foreign again. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's this how sac- sad. self-sacrificial kind of love that is a giving love to, towards the other person. You see, it says that Christ loved the church and gave himself yeah, up for her. Yeah. It's wonderful when husbands and wives show this kind of love to one another. Yeah. I remember an experience some years ago. Uh, I was teaching at uh, Union College and uh, it was our 25th wedding anniversary time period. Now, we've just celebrated recently our 40th wedding anniversary. So that's, this You've is a few years back. you kidding, my this goodness. This is a, four year, a few years back. And we had gotten into the habit of sending each other uh, roses 
on our on our anniversary September. Sending each other. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I would I would get roses for her. I usually get, get num the number of roses for the number of years, and then I would also add a white rose Amen. as well in there. See, so oh, you're a romantic. <laughs> yes, and my <laughs> wife is too. So. I come to my office that morning and I walk into my office and here is a bouquet of 25 red roses. And I just laughed out loud because <laughs> she had done this surprise for me, you know. And she had this vase with these 25 red roses in it. And uh, actually then I got me, gave me impetus. I called up and I ordered 20, <laughs> 25 plus the white rose so that she would have those as well. <sighs> but it, I still remember this. I, it, it, it was uh, at lunchtime, I was scheduled to go to the cafeteria, to the Union College cafeteria, and to meet with a club of, uh, of uh, poets. It was a poetry club that I had helped to establish. And so I, you know, I'm the kind of guy that, you know, if you got good news, man, you got to share it. You got to share the good news. So it, it was lunchtime. I took those 25 roses in that big vase and I walked over to the cafeteria and I didn't know exactly, I didn't remember exactly where this poetry club was meeting. It, it turns out it was at the beginning, or the, right towards the beginning of the, when you walk into the cafeteria, but I didn't realize that. And I walked all the way through the cafeteria looking for <laughs> this, uh, this group of people. Now, I don't know if you've ever carried 25 red roses in a vase uh, through a uh, cafeteria. <laughs> I'll tell you what happened. <laughs> Everybody was turning. Most certainly. Looking at those 25 red roses. When you have good news, you have to share it. See, so she had done something loving. Hopefully they knew who they were, who they were going to <laughs> or who they were from. <laughs> well, <laughs> even if they didn't, I was, I was impressed with how, uh, how red roses like that, 25 red roses yeah. really turned the head. You bet. <laughs> <laughs> so, Paul. My goodness, I just can't believe this. Not only are you a romantic, but you're into poetry too. It oh, doesn't get yeah. any better than that, I've written, girls. <laughs> I've written a few poems for my wife. Uh, oh. I wrote, wrote sonnets for a while and uh, made her cry. With oh, her boy. With, uh, boy. About boy. that. So, yeah, sh uh, showing love. I mean, those are small things. The, the kinds of things that Paul stresses here are really giving yourself. Um, for, for the Apostle Paul, the cross is the paradigm yeah. for the Christian home. The cross is the paradigm for the Christian home. It's the paradigm for how the husband is to show. It's this self-giving, sacrificial love. Uh, Christ was the model for the wife. It says, as to the Lord, she is to submit as to the Lord. And Christ is the model for the husband. He is to love as Christ loved the church. And we really shouldn't be surprised at this. Yeah. Because this is Christian marriage. Amen. It's Amen. Christian marriage. And Jesus said, whoever would come after me, let him take up his cross and follow, and follow me. So we shouldn't be surprised that Christian marriage involves sacrifice. Yeah. And the very practical aspect of following Jesus is the way you're supposed to treat other people. You're to treat yes. them as the way that Jesus treated you. Yeah. You're to forgive, you're to be loving, you're to give up your desires yeah. to help and bless them. See, the whole mm -hmm. Greco-Roman thing of the husband being in charge, it all focuses on his desires. Yes. Now Jesus turns that around and there's yeah. a new reference point. The new reference yeah. point is Christ. You're supposed to be, that, this is nicely illustrated by <laughs> by an interesting story about killing flies. Killing flies. Um, I used to have trouble killing flies. You know, you take the fly swat and you swat, yeah. and that fly just flies right away, <laughs> you know? Until I, I, I learned some of what they, uh, the, the scientists, you know, your tax dollars at work, they studied the flies, <laughs> you know, and they, they, they noticed that they, they take these slow motion pictures, you know, lots of, of, of pictures all at once. And the fly, when it, get, when it goes up, it, it shies away from where the, uh, you know, the fly swatter's coming down. In fact, I think even some of them, they, they, they come up and they, they go yeah. backwards. And so if you hit where, they, where they're sitting, you just miss them because they're not there anymore. They have that, those eyes that see a bunch of stuff, you know. So actually what you have to do if you want to kill flies uh, is you have to aim behind them. Yes. 
So you aim just behind them and you get them just about every time. Now, I'm, 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 my guess is that that means here at 3ABN there's going to be a lot of more dead flies <laughs> you know, happening. Well, it was kind of amazing when you started telling that. That was my strategy because I'd heard that someplace. Yeah. You even go back further than that, and I don't know how this all started. Of course, we grew up on a farm, and they had no air conditioners back then, and, and there's flies everywhere. Flies everywhere. And they took cotton balls hmm. and put it on the screen doors. Yeah. And if somebody knows the science behind this, I'd like to hear it. But are those cotton balls supposed to keep the flies away? Well, I guarantee it didn't work, <laughs> you know, but I mean, and then I'd heard later on in life after I had passed the torch of fly to someone else, you know, is that yeah. they did kind of back up a little bit. Yeah, no, so, so this is my point. Okay. The reference point is different. The reference point, you know, the old reference point was yes. to shoot where the fly was yep. and you won't get it. You know, so yep. the new reference point is shoot behind them and you'll get it. So yep. the old reference point for the home was my selfish desires. The new reference point for the home is to be like Jesus Amen. and to have his desires. Remember, again, we said this is only possible by the Holy Spirit living in our yes. lives. This is a very practical concept of what it means to be a Christian. Sometimes people get this idea of sort of a ethereal, well, we just yeah. believe the truth, you know, and all the truths of the Bible. No, you know what? The truths of the Bible are very practical. Amen. Are you treating people in your home in a loving manner. Yeah. If we were to ask the people in your home, is this person, you know, acting like Jesus? Yeah. You know, and what they said. And if they're not, if they said, well, <laughs> sometimes, but if they say, well, no, not really. Well, that, that's a wake up call. Yes. I need to be cognizant. Um, there was one time a, a, a story about a, um, I think it was a Mennonite preacher and another preacher um, an evangelical preacher had moved into town and he came and he met the uh, Mennonite preacher and he asked him if he'd been born again. <laughs> okay, he hasn't been born again. I, I kind of assumed that the, yeah, the pastor would be born that. again, that, you know, but <laughs> this guy asked him if he'd been born again. And the Mennonite guy said to him, well, you're, you're asking the wrong man. He said, I can, I can give you some names of the people in my church or in my town that I've had disputes with that I've need to, you know, make things right with. And I'll give you the names of these people that I've had disputes with, and you can go ask them if I've been born again. Uh. See, that's really more of a test than my own testimony about yeah. it. What does my family say? Yeah. Do they say, oh, he's a loving person? Yeah. Do the people I work with in my office, do they recognize me as that kind yeah. of a person? Or, or are they glad to see me leave? Yeah, it says, <laughs> oh, he's out of town for a <laughs> yeah, he's out of town. Okay. But well, we better press on here to verse yes. 26 and 27. Let's read those again. Okay. 26 and 27. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, and that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. All right. Now, um, Paul again makes a comparison to the church here. Mm -hmm. Okay. He launches off, in fact, into the topic, almost to the point that people say, uh, Paul, are you, yeah. are you still talking about yeah. the home? Mm -hmm. Or are you talking about yeah. the church? He talks about how Jesus made the sacrifice that he did, why he did that. The purpose was to redeem people, yep. to produce in their lives a holy and blameless character. The washing of water is a reference to baptism. Mm -hmm. They would have the baptismal, we say it today, you know, I baptize you in the name in of the, the Father, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Washing of water by the word, the washing of water at the time that the, this statement is, is, is made. The goal of baptism and Christian teaching is a sanctified holy life, yes. that, you, that you live like Jesus. Mm. And uh, this really mm. uh, links into Paul's ecclesiology, his whole teaching about the church which runs through the book of Ephesians. He's got a lot to say about the church and he doesn't forget to talk about it when he's talking about yeah. the Christian home. He's still talking about the Christian home, but uh, he places a lot of uh, things in here about the church. So I'd like to just review briefly, we've only got a couple minutes left, but uh, I'd like to review briefly just uh, the, his teaching about the church. In, in Ephesians 1 verse 22, he says that Christ is the head of the church. 
that God gave him this role. Christ is the head of the church. In chapter 3, verses 10 and 21, he says, the church is where God reveals wisdom to cosmic powers. His glory is revealed in the church to all generations. Now that, that's a pretty striking statement because a lot of people all think of the church as pretty much nothing. Yeah. You know, they, they think it has nothing to do with anything important. You know what? That's not true. <laughs> it is in the church where God reveals wisdom mm -hmm. to cosmic powers. In 523, he says the church is the body of Christ and Christ is the church's savior. Mm -hmm. And in our passage right here, verses 24 to 29, mm -hmm. he says the church is to be subject to Christ and is nourished and cherished by him. So there's a process the church goes through in becoming holy. It's an initial washing on in the waters of baptism. And then he sets aside the church, for, is set aside for Christ, but then he purifies the church and perfects it. So, you, you know, when you think of this in terms of a Christian home kind of a concept, you say to yourself, well, this, uh, this role of Christ cleansing the church doesn't mean that the, the husband's supposed to correct his wife, you know, and make her do this or make her do that. But he is to think of his role in terms of how can I bless her? How can I help her to be happier? How can I help her to be you know, the better Christian that she wants to be. It's not a controlling mm -hmm. kind of, I'm going to direct yeah. you. It's a self-sacrificing kind of love like Jesus made for the mm -hmm. church. Yes, yeah, servanthood to each other. Right, service to each other and taking care of each other. Yeah. So um, even as he digresses and, and, and talks about the sacrifice that, uh, that Christ made for the church, he's still talking about Christian marriage. He's still talking about the Christian home. Um, and you know, you can also say he's talking about Christian leadership. We think about leaders in the church and uh, too many times, uh, well, I don't know about in the church. I think most people in the church, they want to they wanna follow Jesus. They want to do what's right. Sometimes we get examples. At least they know the terminology to use and yeah. they're there because they're looking for something yeah. better. I mean, people out in the world, they're about the power, about getting yeah. it for themselves. But in the church, it's different. So um, this kind of leadership, in the home, shown in the home, where there's self-sacrifice made, it's not hard to follow. Yeah. 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 You just make it so, so practical and so, right. so simple. I, appre I appreciate this very much. We thank you for spending this time with us. We do hope that you gain something from it. Yeah. We look forward to the next teaching. In the meantime, we've learned more about the instructions to husbands. God bless you. <laughs>